Now, I'm not one to gossip, but I will bring you the tea. Welcome to Chronicle Speaks. Please, please, I don't have any time for any gossip now. Hey, eh? Hey. Yes. Look at you. Art, uh, if you listen, help! We have a new installment of As the Ex Mogul Turns. So your boy Diddy seems to be one step closer to the possibility of an upcoming release. The abeyance that his team filed requesting the appellate court place his appeal on hold while he seeks to file a new bail request with a new bail package in district court with new judge, Judge Aaron Submaranian, has been approved. So we are going to break down exactly what that means. We're also going to talk about the freak off videos obtained by the New York Post showing Diddy and others engaging in sexual acts that sometimes involved women who were coerced and threatened to perform hours long sex acts sometimes after Diddy had just rubbed elbows with some of the hottest names in the industry. Diddy's attorneys are livid about this information coming out and taking their issues to the judge for him to decide how to handle these leads. Lastly, we're going to talk about attorney Tony Busby who once had 120 victims, 60 male and 60 female that were suing Diddy. Now the number is is at a whopping 200. We have so much to discuss in the world of Diddy. We are going to get into that and so much more, but before we do, please be sure to subscribe to this channel and hit this bell for notifications so you don't miss out on any news regarding this story and so much more. Now let's get back into it. So Diddy's money is screaming, if there's a will, there's a way. His attorneys are honestly working around the clock to ensure their client's release, and it seems like they are one step closer to the possibility of making that happen. So we all know that Diddy has had two bail denials thus far. That's when he enlisted the help of attorney Alexandra Shapiro, who filed an appeal stating where the court erred in considering the release of Diddy. Well, a three-judge panel was set to rule on this appeal on November 4th, which which happens to be Diddy's birthday. However, Diddy's team now has something new up their sleeves. They state that because of new information they have, they would like to place this appeal in abeyance, basically on hold, and request another bail with a new bail package in district court that will be viewed in front of new judge, Judge Aaron Submaranian. And just like the two judges before him, Judge Tarnarski and Judge Carter, now Judge Submaranian will have the opportunity to either approve or deny Diddy's new bail package. Now with the abeyance of the appeal that's currently in appellate court, it's sitting on hold until the district court decides whether or not to approve or deny this bail package. If he decides to deny it, Diddy can still go back to appellate court and have that three judge panel review the appeal that's currently there. So we'll have to see how all of this plays out in court and you know I'll be there to update you on all of it. So while all of this is going on, behind the scenes, the government and Diddy's attorneys have been going at it. Diddy's attorneys have been arguing that the government has been leaking information information about the case to the press and they are requesting the court to intervene first the judge was like look y'all try to figure it out yourselves and if not i'll intervene and see what we can do so neither sides could agree on the wording of the order so both sides submitted their own proposals to the judge the judge decided not to accept either proposal completely instead he issued an order emphasizing the existing rules that both sides must follow about keeping information confidential the order aims to prevent any leaks that could affect the fairness of the trial. The judge made it clear that there is no evidence of any wrongdoing thus far. So with Diddy's team thinking that the government side has released all of this information to the press, therefore hurting Diddy's case, the judge is not in agreement of that. Then after the dust settles with all of that, then here comes the New York Post with an article saying Sean Diddy Combs' mixed star-studded bashes with raucous freak-off sex parties after VMAs and Super Bowl video reveals. So the New York Times says Sean Diddy Combs' freak-offs often coincided with some of the biggest star-studded parties at the height of his fame, with at least three wild sex parties taking place hours after major events, according to a trove of video files and documents viewed exclusively by the Post. The clip suggests that the orgies which federal prosecutors say sometimes involved women who were threatened or coerced to perform grueling hours-long sex acts were happening just below the surface as Diddy rubbed elbows 
deals with the biggest names in Hollywood, music, and sports. In the early morning hours of August 29, 2005, the Diddy after party from the MTV BMAs was going strong. Actress Eva Longoria chatted with Fergie in one corner while Ice-T, Quincy Jones, NASCAR greats Jeff Gordon, and Paris Hilton mingled with guests. Holmes had hosted the VMAs and his after party was the hottest ticket in town that night. But one by one, the celebrities left the party and there is no indication they knew about or were involved in what happened next. Soon the event moved from the inside at Space Nightclub to Diddy's Miami mansion. From there, it appears to have descended into a raucous sex party according to photos and videos viewed by the Post. By then, all the stars appeared to have gone except one. Diddy. They were replaced by a cast of fit young men and women all in various states of undress as two white men took turns having sex with a very young black woman who clearly had white powder under her nose. Diddy could be seen in the background wearing a t-shirt with the words God is the greatest written in black. The same t-shirt he was photographed wearing at the VMA's after party. In another clip from the night, a couple had loud sex on the table as a group of well-dressed people stood around. Videos reviewed by the Post are part of the same archive that includes footage that appears to show Diddy having sex with a much younger male a list star that video has been shopped around for sale to news outlets by more than one purported seller in the trouble files some of the videos are undated or the dates are clearly incorrect but other files have dates that are consistent with verified details of events locations and clothing that Diddy and others were wearing however many of the videos have dates that can be corroborated with star-studded events including the 2004 and 2005 VMAs in Miami and the 2005 Super Bowl in in Jacksonville. After each of these events, Diddy appears to have thrown a wow orgy. The alleged behavior is consistent with a similar allegation in a lawsuit filed earlier this week in which a woman alleges Diddy and a female celebrity awed her when she was just 13 following the 2000 VMAs at Radio City Music Hall in New York. Diddy's attorneys denied the latest allegations in a statement. In court, the truth will prevail that Mr. Combs has never essayed anyone, adult or minor, man or woman. During the weekend of Super Bowl 39 in Jacksonville in February 2005, Diddy threw a star-studded gala with attendees like Ashton Kutcher, Ashley Simpson, and Girls Gone Wild founder Joe Francis. Hours later, the party seemingly moved to a $2 million mansion in nearby Sawgrass, which Diddy rented for a reported $20,000 per week. In one video, two men have sex with each other while the sounds of laughter echo throughout the room. It later appears that Diddy himself took part in the action that night and held the camera from his point of view while he appeared to engage in sex with a woman. Again, there's no indication that the Super Bowl party guests knew about the orgy that took place afterward. It's unclear whether the videos that the Post have viewed are part of the Fed's case, but officials say they confiscated hundreds of videos from Combs' hard drives and devices, some of which include freak-off sex parties. These are consistent with the videos we have. A federal law enforcement source who is involved in the investigation said after hearing descriptions of the scenes in the video that the Post viewed. Just about everything you can imagine was happening at his parties. Now our job is to determine whether this was consensual for everyone involved. If anyone has been trafficked and what laws have been broken. In the videos viewed by the Post, the identities of most of the participants are unknown, but the feds believe that at least some of the victims in the videos they obtained were coerced to perform. Combs threatened his victims, the feds said after his arrest, including by threatening to expose the embarrassing and sensitive recordings he made of freak-offs if the women did not comply with his demands. Diddy has been charged with racketeering, conspiracy, sex trafficking, and transportation to engage in prostitution. In addition, in addition to the charges, he faces a myriad of civil suits from his alleged victims. He has pled not guilty and consistently denied wrongdoing in both the criminal cases and the civil suits. So yesterday, Diddy's attorney Mark Ignifolo was like, look, I've had about enough. The fact that the government can speak to the New York Post and say, you know what, your tapes are consistent with what we have and Diddy has some wild sex parties and just about everything you can imagine happened at Diddy's party and this is some sick shit. Diddy's attorney is like, look, Y'all are not supposed to be communicating back and forth with the press, especially about information that is not available to the public. 
Agnipolo goes on to state that this latest article underscores the need for the court's order to be appropriately expansive and to cover any and all agents in a position to have access to videos, evidence, case information, or be familiar with the investigation either directly or indirectly. The government's proposed order would allow this clear misconduct to go unabated and would protect federal agents involved in their investigation from the ramifications of intentionally violating a defendant's right to a fair trial free from false damaging and intentional statements made to the press. That this conduct is continuing demonstrates disregard for the clear concern this court has shown for this fundamental issue. In the larger context of the unrelated leaks and false statements made by agents over the last seven months, today's article shows DHS has formed an illicit partnership with different press outlets which the agency has used and will use to ruin this man's ability to get a fair trial. The need for an immediate gag order is clear. The court should enter Mr. Combs's proposed order or the prejudicial leaks will only continue. So Agnifolo feels like Diddy's reputation is being tainted before he's able to prove his innocence. He also feels like the government has an unfair advantage being able to link up with certain media outlets to be able to give their own opinions without being able to prove facts first in court. So let's get to attorney Tony Busby. Tony Busby released seven lawsuits last week in which we went over six of them. I thought I was able to save all of them and one I forgot to save. I went back to try to go look at it and he took it down the reason why he took it down he had to enter in the information requesting that the John Doe be able to go under the pseudonym John Doe and not include his real name I went back today and it's there but what he added in this time is now he has 200 victims that are coming forward and no longer 120 so he's added 80 to the list so first let me get into the restraining order that the security guard who had his wife walk in when Diddy was fondling his man parts and she had to break it up because the man was inebriated, gone off of whatever Diddy had given him. This restraining order speaks of the now 200 people that Busby represents. Take a listen to this. I, Anthony G. Busby, hereby declares as follows. I am the owner of the Busby Law Firm and counsel for John Doe. I make the declarations in support of plaintiff's motion to proceed anonymously. If required by the court, I will disclose plaintiff's name to counsel for defense. However, I would respect a hearing prior to any such order. Plaintiff is by no means the only victim of Mr. Combs to fear violence and retribution for coming forward. My firm currently represents over 200 clients with claims against Mr. Combs. So at one point it was at 120, now it's over 200. So it could be 203, it could be 295. We have no idea, but these lawsuits are going to continue to come. So let's go ahead and get into the 17 year old John Doe's complaint. In 2022, John Doe, a then 17 year old aspiring artist, hoped to break into the music industry. A separate individual with ties to Combs and his music and business enterprises recruited Doe to attend a party at a penthouse at a Manhattan hotel. The recruiter promised the event would be filled with artists and industry celebrities and professionals, providing an opportunity for plaintiff to promote himself. The recruiter assured Doe that he would have the chance to connect with influential industry leaders who could pave the way for his advancement. Doe, eager for the opportunity, saw the party as a chance to network, create connections, and advance his career as an artist. When Doe arrived at the penthouse, he immediately noticed Combs among other well-known musicians and industry persons. Combs greeted Doe and offered him a drink. Trusting the gesture, Doe accepted. They made small talk regarding the industry and Combs assured Doe that he could make him a star. Shortly after, Doe began feeling strange. He felt dizzy, weak, and confused, far beyond what he would expect from having consumed a single drink. It became clear that something was wrong. He realized later he had been drugged. A photograph of an actual exemplary container used by Combs and or his agents or employees to insert GHB into alcoholic drinks is seen below. Realizing something was wrong, Doe staggered towards another room of the penthouse, searching for the restroom, but found himself somewhere else. Once in the new room, he witnessed multiple people engaging in group sex, including Combs and another artist he recognized. After Doe entered the room, Combs approached him, grabbed him, and led him to the bed, forcing him to lie down on the bed against his will. Combs moved directly next to Doe on the bed while others lay next to them engaging in sexual activities, including oral sex and sexual penetration. Combs grabbed Doe's Johnson and genitals with his hands. Combs manipulated Doe's genitals for an extended period of time, trying to get him aroused. Doe was not aroused, but was instead scared and disgusted. Doe told Combs that the reason he could not get aroused is because he had to use 
use the restroom. Combs permitted him to get up off the bed as Combs then turned back to the others in the bed and rejoined the group's sexual activities. From the bathroom, Doe called a friend to come pick him up and immediately left the Manhattan Hotel. Combs continued with his party as if nothing happened. For Doe, everything had changed. The friend Doe called to pick him up found him waiting outside the hotel. Doe was visibly disoriented and unsteady, his demeanor reflecting someone under the influence of drugs far removed from his usual self. Once in the car, Doe recounted to his friend that he felt he had been drugged had his privates and genitals manipulated and fondled, and there was an orgy taking place in the hotel's penthouse, Doe then passed out in the car. As a result of Combs' essay, Doe experienced damages including pain and suffering, mental anguish, physical impairment, and emotional torment. The interaction continues to humiliate and cause shame on Doe. Further, the assault ultimately shattered Doe's passion for music, leading him to abandon his aspirations entirely. The reality and dark underbelly of the industry, as revealed through his encounter with Combs, ended his dream and desire to pursue a career in that world. Because of Combs' power and notoriety, Doe was afraid to immediately report what had happened. The longer he waited, the more difficult it was to report. Doe became yet another essay victim of Combs, through the same pattern and abuse of influence comes as exercise over others previously. It's going to be interesting to see how Diddy works through all of these lawsuits if he decides to pay these people off or if he is actually going to fight all of them. But with over 200 and you're also going through a Fed case, I'm not sure how this is going to work out. What I need to do is hear from you. What do you think about everything going on with Diddy? And what do you think about his team thinking that the government is releasing all of this information to the press? Leave a comment and you know how we do. We'll talk about it down below. Talk to you guys later. Bye. Once again, thanks for watching. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, hit the like button, and hit that bell so you don't miss out on any of my new episodes.